Welcome, welcome everyone. Greetings and welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host, I'm its creator and chief cat herder, and I'll be your guide to the next hour of conversation as we collaboratively explore the future of higher education. I am absolutely delighted to be able to welcome Dr. Bell Wheeler. Dr. Bell is a president of the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, one of the nation's large accrediting agencies. And these are the groups that are responsible for, among other things, trying to make sure that higher education attains and seeks to build on certain levels of quality. And greetings. We lost you there for a minute. I was about to panic and wonder, what do I do now since I'm not familiar with this technology? Well, I can't imagine you being anything other than perfectly cool. <laughs> I'll pay you later. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> well, you're, you're being very, very, uh, very nervous right now. We are, uh, I, I have so many questions to ask you, but the first is, uh, where, where are you coming to us from today? I'm in Decatur, Georgia, which is uh, right outside of Atlanta. And it's probably a little warm there right now? Actually, it's about 64 degrees, so it, it cold. It was 82 day before yesterday, so this is pneumonia-catching weather for us. <laughs> <laughs> 82 is what I would have expected. Yeah. Uh, I, what we do here in the forum to introduce people, besides mentioning um, a brief background, is I like to ask people what they're going to be doing in the next year. Uh, what are the big projects, the big topics, the big ideas that are really going to be top of mind for you for the next year? Well, for the next year, we're trying to figure out how to bring people back safely into the building, uh, you know, how to encourage people to get vaccinated without requiring it, since we come in contact with so many different people and our staff travels, you know, all over the country doing visits and things and uh, trying to make sure that all of our professional development activities can now go back to being in person. Uh, we had to scramble like all of the institutions did and put our annual meeting up uh, in a virtual format last December and it went very well uh, and people raved over it, but they still want to meet in public. So working with hotels to make sure they're still functioning in you know, CDC guidelines. So those are the mechanical things that we'll be dealing with. Uh, more importantly, are still working with institutions to make sure that they're as strong as they can be in the offerings that they have for their students, both in the curriculum and in support services. So that business continues. That's indeed, that's, <laughs> that's, that's your goal. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, please know that I have all kinds of questions for our guests, but the real goal here is to convey your questions, your thoughts, uh, your ideas. So again, just please feel free to uh, press the button to raise your hand so you can join us on stage with video or type in a question uh, or a comment. And it also, if you'd like to learn more about, uh, about uh, Dr. Wheeling's group, if you look in the bottom left corner of your screen, there's a kind of tan colored button, I should say, uh, the homepage of the group. So you just press that and you'll get a link to their website right there. Um, and before, well, before I can even finish saying that, we already have a question. That's how eager, eager. <laughs> uh, this is a question from the uh, longtime friend and supporter of the program uh, coming to us from uh, the Houston, Texas area, uh, from Tom Ames. And Tom asks, accredited agencies have a lot to do with defining the language of higher education. Can or should accreditation be used to drive innovation by redefining basic terminology? Uh, perhaps would be a one word answer for you, Tom. Uh, People always think of the accreditor as this group of folks sitting back in an office somewhere for us in the, uh, in, in our case, in the city of Decatur, trying to think up things for institutions to do. The reality is we are a membership organization and the things that we do come from suggestions that our members make. Uh, we have a 77 member board that uh, is represented. At, yeah, we have one of the largest boards of any organization. Yeah. Uh, because it's representative of states. Every state in our region has at least four members on our board. So that would be 44 members right there. Uh, and they bring ideas to us and they tell us what they you know, think is appropriate and what they think isn't appropriate. And so we kind of follow their direction. There are occasions when 
uh, you know, I and my shying, retiring self will open my mouth and say, well, have we thought about such and such? But for the most part, what we do is driven by our members. So anytime you think that there's something that our members should be doing, just send me an email and let me know that this is something. All of the innovation that happens in our region at, that we approve or not comes from the membership. And uh, we have tried very hard not to stifle any innovation from any institution. I think dual enrollment started uh, because of innovative institutions that said, you know, we need to grab a hold of these seniors in high school who have finished their high school curriculum and we don't want them running the streets. Uh, you know, let's get them started on their college curriculum. And it has expanded, of course, into juniors who you know are honor students and in the state of texas all the way down to freshmen uh you know the uh, those kinds of things are innovations that that come forward the um use of distance education uh, started in institutions it was not something that the accreditors do what we have to do is to validate that the quality of whatever that innovation is is of uh, appropriate standard for an institution of higher education so should we be defining it i think on one level we do because we have to approve what goes out there but should be we be the ones generating it uh, mm -hmm. we certainly encourage our institutions but we're not in a position to force you to do a whole bunch of of stuff so, i hope that answered your question tom oh, it's a great question and bill that's a very very rich answer uh, so if if new terminology comes up it's more much more likely that you'll look for it surfacing from your members rather than you creating it and giving it to them. Give you a, a current example, the equity, diversion, and inclusion language that is out there. Mm -hmm. When I came to the commission uh, 16 years ago, believe it or not, in 2005, nowhere did we talk about inclusion or diversity. Mm -hmm. even. You know, I'm the first minority and the first woman in this position in the history of the commission. And, I, you know, I, it just wasn't one of those things you thought about. We just kind of did. But I asked the question, do we value diversity? Not just racial diversity, but gender, religion religion, you know, any kind of diversity out there. And so we finally put up a policy statement on diversity. Well, now we've got, we've expanded that to include diversity and inclusion as well. And so one way that we are encouraging our institutions to look at that is in our requirement on student achievement. We ask them to disaggregate the data based on socioeconomic status, gender, race, whatever, to make sure that all students are moving forward. Uh, that's the way we have taken to, you know, uh, implementing change, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. in our organization to our institutions, rather than mandate that you have to do this and you have to do that. If the membership comes forward or the board comes forward representing the membership saying, we need a standard that talks about diversity, then we'll put one in. Otherwise, we just kind of encourage our institutions and you know their peers who are going in there and saying we're doing these kinds of things why aren't you and and so it it moves maybe not as quickly as tom or some of his colleagues would like but it does move well that's a, a very very good answer to my question and i, I promised i wouldn't ask too many questions and here i am that's okay. <laughs> so we have a stack of questions coming in from a, a great range of people and i'll make sure everyone gets a chance to uh to ask one so this is coming from uh, Sally Muriamu, coming from Oregon, who asks, what is the role of CHEA with your accreditation group? I often work with partners overseas who don't understand that accreditors are self-governed. <laughs> well, welcome to my world, Sally. Uh, CHIA, as that organization is called, is the Council of Higher Education Accreditation. It began as an organization that represented accreditors in Washington. People in Washington only want one phone number to call mm -hmm. about accreditation. They don't want to have to learn about seven regional accreditors or 50 specialized accreditors. They want one number. And so CHIA was the organization that was founded by the accreditors to be our representative uh, in Washington to take bring stuff to us from the hill and then to take stuff back. Uh, there was a um, <laughs> change of personalities, both among the uh, accreditors and the uh, president of, of the previous CHIA organization, it was called COPA. Uh, and so they decided they would represent institutions' interests in accreditation rather than the accreditor's interest. Wow. So they, we are recognized by CHIA by choice 
uh, to say that, yeah, these are the things you want done. And so, yes, we agree to do these kinds of things, much like we are recognized by the Department of Education. With the Department of Education, there's a bigger carrot, though, because uh, federal financial aid is involved with our, the, our relationship with the feds. There is no relationship, you know, other than a goodwill one with Chia. We are recognized by Chia, however, uh, because it, I think, the right thing to do. But there's there's no pro or con to to us belonging or not. A couple of the um, re formerly known as regional accreditors are not recognized by Chia, or they're reconsidering whether they're going to be. Oh wow! Uh, just a quick question: When did Chia have that change of personality? Well, I've been here 16 years, so it was probably 22, 23 years ago. Okay, maybe back yeah. in the 20th century. Then. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question, Sally. Thank you. Uh, and Sally, kudos, by the way, for your uh, your um, nice futures program. It's good to see that. Love to hear more about it. Uh, we have a ton of questions coming in. And again, friends, if you just want to ask questions uh, either out loud, press the raised hand button, or if you want to type them out like we've been seeing here, just type in the Q&A box. Uh, and we've got one here from the uh, splendid Steve Ehrman, uh, who asks, I understand something of how accreditors support and encourage improved or quality of learning outcomes. What's good practice for encouraging equitable access to degrees and a more affordable education? Wow, Stephen, uh, if I could answer that question in a pithy response, I would. Um, that's going to vary from institution to institution because the missions of our institutions vary. And so they're going to tackle both of those issues uh, differently. Uh, what we ask for in our, and depending on which part of the country you're in, we'll also address those differently. In our region, we have what we call the quality enhancement plan, which is where we ask an institution to identify a project that you think will move students forward. Uh, you know, engage the entire institution and uh, see how how much better students are performing because of whatever it is that you did. One of my favorite examples was done by a community college in Mississippi uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago, uh, where they were concerned that their students were not completing their programs. And in going back, looking at data to figure out why, they realized it was because the students never completed or didn't do well in the basic math course, because mm -hmm. math is basic to every major. And so they went in and revamped the math course and they pulled faculty from all over the college saying, asking what skills do your students need in your program, you know, in this math course. And even over one semester, the grades improved and the retention rates improved. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of outcomes that we look for. Uh, we do leave it up to institutions to kind of identify those issues and to uh, make predictions on what will happen. And then we ask them to go back in and make changes if they didn't get the desired results. You know, what what happened and, and uh, how can you do better? Or what can you do differently that will indeed move that needle forward? So that's going to vary, uh, you know, based on uh, whatever the institution is choosing. Of course, graduation rates and licensure passage rates mm. you know, are also important. Uh, employability rates are also important. But for us, it's more important that those students are actually learning something, uh, because if they're going to learn something, then, I, then they should be able to get a job. It's a great question, Stephen, uh, and uh, I recommend his new book uh, when uh, when uh, folks can buy it. And thank you, Bell, for that for that perfect answer. We have uh, another question that brings us back to Georgia. Actually, uh, this is from Robert uh, Keown, uh, who uh, at the Technical College System of Georgia, who asks, "How did the movement to distance education due to the pandemic affect the viewpoint of Sachs Cock? And are there any anticipated changes and updates?" from lessons learned in the distance education realm. Yeah, SACS COC <laughs> has uh, 780 member institutions and all but about 75 were already offering distance education programs. So it was not a major change for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't anticipate a lot of changes that will happen. We gave, uh, thanks to the Department of Ed, a waiver to those 75 to immediately go online, even though we had not approved them for a program, but they have subsequently had to get approval in order to continue to offer distance learning. Biggest reason for that was because the department waited too late to decide whether they were gonna extend that into this current semester. And we didn't want to have to tell institutions, you know, tough turkey, you can't offer anything via distance, or if you do, your students can't use federal financial aid. That seemed like cruel and unusual punishment. And it was easier to get a program approved. So now all of our programs are 
doing that. I was ecstatic, though, in the uh, communication that occurred among all of our institutions, not just those 75, but people reached out to say, hey, I know that you're new at this. You know, here's some things that you can do. Here's some training that we're offering. Send your your uh, faculty, you know, to attend them via, you know, uh, virtual platform. Uh, and there was a lot of resource and information information sharing, uh, which was just wonderful because some, like I said, those 75 institutions were caught flat footed uh, cause they just didn't do that. And it's uh, over the summer, especially, there was a lot of professional development that went on for all of our institutions, because even though you, you have an institution that has maybe one program, suddenly everybody's got to move online. And so even within those institutions that have been using, uh, you know, distance learning, you had faculty and staff who had never used it before. Yep. So uh, they, they've come a long way and the teams that go out are, you know, looking at how well they're doing and how they had to wrap up to, you know, to get uh, to what they needed to be for the students. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a great answer. Uh, we have more questions coming in. And again, friends, you can see this is uh, all about uh, your questions and your comments. I think we have two that are almost the same questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna flash them up both in a row just so you can see what I mean. This is kind of eerie. Uh, from Kelvin Bentley, awesome, awesome fellow. What is the near future of accreditation given the shift now towards schools to seek any accrediting body since there's no longer a distinction between national and regional accreditation? So hang on to that for a second because at the same time, Jessica X at the Florida Institute of Technology asks, what do you think of their impact, the removal of the distinction of regional accreditor will mean for accrediting agencies? Will some shrink or grow? So part of it is about what happens to individual campuses and part of it is what happens to accrediting agencies. Thank you both to Calvin and Jessica for the great questions. You know, that's probably the uh, question uh, about which I get asked most. And there, there are several caveats to that. First of all, the Department of Education has decided that they themselves are going to refer to uh, national and regional accreditors as institutional accreditors, uh, because we all have to uh, be recognized using the same process. And so in the previous administration's mind anyway, there should not be a difference in how they refer to us. That does not mean that there are not distinctions between the national and regional accreditors, or for that matter, among regional accreditors. We all are driven by our own members. The other caveat is they allowed us to continue to refer to ourselves as regional accreditors. The reason they made the change in the first place was twofold. One, because of the transfer of credit issue. Many students who attend what had been considered national accredited institutions had great difficulty getting their credits transferred to regional accreditors. Uh, no matter how, how hard we tried to explain to the department that transfer of credit has less to do with from what accreditor the credit is coming and more from what institutions are willing to accept because we don't determine transfer of credit. It's institutions that determine what credits that they will uh, accept. And we have institutions we accredit that don't accept credits from other institutions we accredit. So we thought that that was fallacious, but that was something that they wanted. And then the other argument, of course, was that since we're all recognized by the department that we should do that. So right this minute, um, yes, it is true that if a uh, regional accreditor that had currently uh, or uh, previously had not accepted applications outside of their geographic areas for which they had been recognized by the department, now do that and can do that, uh, then they will have to go through the regular application process. All of the regionals have not decided to do that yet. Our board will uh, consider that issue in June. I don't know if we'll lose any members. I don't, uh, you know, I, I we have, uh, always been accused of being the toughest of the regionals. I don't apologize for that because nobody questions the quality of the instruction that comes through or the quality of our graduates. So why would I want to do any differently? And, you know, if you can already meet the standards of the toughest, why would you want to go someplace else? But, you know, that is an institutional choice. It always has been. We are the second largest of the, of the formerly known as regional accreditors. And I would imagine that uh, some of the other accrediting bodies would like to have more members, uh, you know, so I don't, I don't know. But the other piece is that 
even though we accredit institutions in 11 states, we, we operate institutions in 43 states because our institutions are just moving along and providing instruction because of mergers and consolidations. They've joined with other campuses. And so we actually have institutions in our region that have sites of some sort in 43 of the states. That was another argument that the department had. You're not really regional that, you know, you really are national because your institutions have spread out. So, but we, right this minute, we, we are still referring to ourselves as pr primarily a regional accreditor. We've not had, uh, I, I says our said, our board has not uh, said whether they're willing to accept applications from outside of the region. And even if they do, we haven't gotten any yet. So, you know, we, we're, we'll see. And there's no change in your name. You're still Sac. No, that's right. We're still Sac COC. That's right. Yeah, so I'll have that S yes. for Southern. Um, yes. Yeah. This is this is a great topic. And it was a huge, almost seismic shift, and I'm I'm grateful to uh, uh, Kelvin and Jessica for yeah. asking. And, uh, Brian, as an aside, I, the SHEOs, who are the state higher education officers, are mm -hmm. very concerned about that change because there is legislation in the name of the specific accreditor that they may now have to go and change. And that's a pain in the derriere. And so there may be a movement to approach this administration to change it back. So, you know, welcome to my world. Just <laughs> Yeah. We'll take it one day at a time. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we actually have a related question to that came up from uh, uh, out in the West Coast. Uh, Mark Corbett Wilson asked a California question. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on California ending its state approval of small institutions and forcing them to become accredited, move or cease to exist? Several small graduate institutes have already closed. I don't think that the accreditors are going to push for that. Uh, if anything, you know, it's the state because of how much money they're pouring into the state. I'm not familiar with that situation, though, uh, so I, I can't intelligently answer it. But I, I, uh, Jamie Studley, who is the um, my counterpart in the Western area for senior institutions, has not mentioned that. We, we still have an organization we call CREC which is the Council of Regional Accrediting Commissions uh, that meets every other week uh, via uh, telephone. And she's not brought that forward. I can certainly take it back and, and see what's going on, but I'm not familiar with that one. Um, oops. Uh, Mark, that's a great question. And uh, Bill, I appreciate your candor and answer this. Mark, if, if you've got a, a link you can share with us, please uh, pop it in the chat and, uh, and uh, I'll share it around. Um, as you can see, we're covering a, a, a huge range of topics. Um, this is just how powerful and how interwoven accrediting is. So please, uh, friends, don't uh, don't be shy. This is a great time for, uh, for your thoughts. Uh, we also had a question um, that came up that's a more kind of strategic or conceptual question uh, from Paul Henley in Texas. And Paul asks, how do you see the relationship between innovation and compliance? And when might innovation be more important? Well, I, I, who told you innovation was not as important? Uh, we, we've certainly never said that. I think that historically, uh, the accreditors have always been perceived as compliance organizations. You know, how many beans do you have? And we have to count them. I and mean, we, we used to literally count library books per discipline because our faculty said that for students who are going to write you know, term papers, they needed to have original sources. And so one way we did that was to literally count library books per discipline. We have not done that since 2002, mm. almost 20 years. Uh, people don't realize that perhaps, but we have not. And so we, we like to think that there's innovation, you know, strewn throughout. Again, for our region, uh, it's the QEP where much of the innovation evolves. Uh, and the QEP is not designed to be a one-time issue. It's supposed to be something that eventually becomes a part of the fabric of the institution. Uh, and so we thought we were moving in that direction. If you don't think we are, because Texas is part of our area, uh, let me know what you think we should be doing. That's that's how change occurs in the region, because you know we hear from those of you out in the field. Uh, either through emails that you send, through sending, communicating with the board members, uh, you know, on the SAC COC board or serving on peer review committees where you can go in and talk to your colleagues when you go to visit their institutions. Thank you, uh, Paul. Thank you for that elegantly phrased question. And uh, Bill, thank you for that very precise response. Um, this is fantastic. 
Uh, we have uh, more questions, and I had no idea that there were so many people in the forum community would be so uh, knowledgeable about creating agencies and have so many good questions. Uh, this is one about a recent development for a few weeks ago. Uh, Kelvin asks, any reactions to this story in terms of whether uh, SAC COC will follow suit? And the story he links to uh, is about the uh, Higher Learning Commission Midwest uh, exploring differences by academic sector. We have not done that because we look at uh, institutions based on their own individual mission. This is not a new issue. It has come up uh, before, but again, that's a result of me being the old fart in the room and having been here longer than any of the other regional accreditors, but having been in those positions, as I said, 16 years. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, high heel shoes. You wait long enough and the style comes back. Yes. Um, but um, Every, every one of us has thought about that. Different institutions have done that. Both Higher Learning Commission and SAC COC have uh, implemented what we call the differentiated accreditation process that is open to any institution that can meet the 12 criteria that we've established. <clears throat> one of them says, you know, you haven't been in trouble with us in the last 10 years. You haven't put in 80,000 substantive changes, you know, not major changes. You've had stable leadership you know, those kinds of things. And so we have 43 institutions that were eligible uh, this year to apply for that. And 24 of them, I think it is, were able to do it. And what that means is they don't have to respond to as many of the standards as everybody else going through reaffirmation would have to respond to because they've done a good job for the last 10 years. Um, but no, we've, we've not looked at sector. I, I'm assuming sector, you mean community colleges versus state institutions versus research one institutions, that kind of sector. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah. I linked to the chat. I just flashed it on the screen. I can share it afterwards as well. Um, yeah, at, at one point they said, there's a quote, they should not treat the Ohio State University and University of Notre Dame the same way they treat institutions with uh, students with high amounts of debt. So I, I think it's well, but but you know, the, for us, we 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 don't think that any of the accreditors do because each of us looks at an individual of uh, institution based on who it says it is and what it says it's doing. Mm -hmm. So it's the same set of standards, but we don't interpret it the same way at every institution. That's the difference. Interesting. Interesting. But I understand the question, and I've been a college employee before on many levels for many years, and so I understand. You have a fantastic, fantastic career. Uh, and Kelvin, speaking of great careers, Kelvin, thank you for that great question. Um, he was a, a fine guest on the program uh, a few months ago. Uh, we have a, a quick follow-up question from a uh, PhD student at Queen's University. Uh, Lena asks, is this a beginning to centralizing accreditation? No. Okay, next question. <laughs> It's a great question, Lena, and please say more about it, please. I, I, I don't think so. I, I think the history of accreditation is too well entrenched. Uh, and as I said, you, you know, we've got people right now, not just uh, the SHIELDS, but uh, institutions saying, why are you trying to mess with something that's been working for over 100 years? Mm. Um, you know, there, there certainly can be some uh, revisions to how we do things, but I don't think it's a, a way of centralizing accreditation. Thank you. That's a really sharp question, um, Lena. And good luck with your PhD. This is a rough time to be doing that, but I'm really good <laughs> luck. But we're here for you to help as we can. Uh, and we had a, another question, um, which uh, comes from someone who can't be here today because of a schedule conflict. But this is uh, uh, Michael Johnson, who works in publishing. He's been a previous guest in the program. And he had a question about uh, how uh, accreditation intersects with accessibility. And he means accessibility in terms of disability. Uh, let me get the full, the full quote for you because it's a, it's a very precise one. Um, uh, when does a campus's ability to uh, have all course material fully accessible to the print disabled play a role in the accreditation process? And he just adds, this seems to, this should link to diversity, equity, and inclusion as well. It, it also links to uh, the support services that are provided to students on campus. And when uh, one of our teams goes in to look at the support services that are available, assuming there is a disability service component somewhere, which is because the federal government requires it, 
Uh, while we don't have direct management of that because the federal government is the one that looks at uh, you know disability requirements, we always ask that question. We have had um, uh, ask our teams to to provide references, and I believe our resource manual even uh, yeah. has references to um, services that can be provided uh, and places to go find. Um, braille and hearing impaired uh, services and things like that. So when, when you know, we try to put people on our committees that have that kind of expertise so that they can share that information as well. At our annual meeting every year, there are always um, sessions on servicing disabilities, you know, students with disabilities. Um, and so it's, it's not something um, that's a, a compliance kind of thing, but it is a service that we look to see if, if uh, institutions are providing. Well, good. That's great news. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the, uh, Michael, thank you for the great question. Uh, we, this is the Future Trends Forum, so we like to look forward to the future of higher education. And there are a stack of questions that have already poked that way. Lena led that way uh, with, her, uh, with her prompt. Um, and Carrie Watkins uh, from TEL Education has a follow-up question. You mentioned innovations such as dual enrollment and distance learning. How are you helping to support your member institutions with options such as certificates and also stackable credentials? Great question, Carrie. We had no idea what our institutions were doing in that vein. And so we wrote a grant to the Lumina Foundation for Education and they funded it so that we could find out who's doing what. Uh, I had worked at a, a community college in Hampton, Virginia, and there was a very close relationship with the Newport News Shipyard uh, because they were offering a credential for you know their employees that we then back in the late 80s uh, learned to apply to associate degrees. And so I knew that it was being done by some institutions, but I didn't know how many. And I was very pleased to see that uh, while literature generally would think that the community colleges would be in a better position to do that because much of those are hands-on skills that can be translated into a credential. There are actually liberal arts institutions that are creating credentials uh, stackable credentials for liberal arts majors. And so there's a lot of activity going on. We did produce a document to show uh, the lessons learned by those particular institutions. We still have copies if anybody's interested, just uh, shoot me an email and we'll see if we can get it for you. But uh, we, are, we are strongly encouraging it. And uh, again, at our annual meeting, we have sessions every year where people are talking about the, the things that they went through to do that. Two years ago, I think, is when we completed that grant, maybe three now with COVID having taken a year. I've lost track of calendar time. But two or three years ago uh, was when that grant was finished. And we had a session then and we've had them ever since. So we strongly encourage them. Uh, you know, I spent 28 years in community colleges. So workforce development is, you know, near and dear to me. And, um, you know, I, I try to help liberal arts institutions understand that every student's going to get a job. They still need those liberal arts skills. And so it is possible to do, you know, writing across the curriculum that would be technical writing. It is possible to do, you know, math that would be, uh, you know, uh, appropriate for some specific career um, without losing that liberal arts flavor. So. It, it's it's still going, and we are very encouraging of it. Um, well, that's a fantastic. You're going in and out, Brian, which is not a good thing because I can't see the questions. <laughs> yes. Right. Had to refresh. <laughs> Um, the uh, that was a great question, and uh, I, again, I, we have about twenty minutes left, and I'll make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak. Uh, I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, we did have um, a question that comes to us from uh, Cal State Monterey Bay, uh, the awesome George Station, longtime friend and supporter of the program, and he asks, "How does how do you accredit agents accredit universities that drastically reduced or shut down programs and departments in the pandemic?" programs that were supposedly doing well in a previous round? Um, we, what we look for is a logical, well-planned uh, strategy for change. So that uh, and if an institution goes in and it decides to close down a program, we want to see what was the rationale for it. Just because we had a pandemic is not rationale enough. Uh, not having enough graduates, not being able to find a faculty member, 
um, not having appropriate equipment, you know, current equipment, those would be much more realistic uh, kinds of reasons for shutting down a program. Uh, you know, we decided to merge with some other institution. The faculty member who had uh, done that program for years retired and we can't find anybody to replace them. Those are the kinds of things we look for. What was your policy for, uh, for retrenchment uh, and for a program or institutional closure? And did you follow it? That's, that's the kind of thing that we would look to see. Um, we, we, we do not sit in judgment of institutions that decide to terminate programs. That's just not, that's not my job. That's the job of the administration and the board at the particular institution. Uh, we do ask, did you involve faculty in the uh, you know, decision to make that change? Uh, and many institutions don't. And when they don't, we kind of, you know, scold them on that because the faculty are, I mean, that's the role of the faculty is, um, you know, to run the academic program. And so that that's the way we would handle it. Don't know how WASC handles it. That's the my counterpart in the West. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is just fantastic to uh, to be able to learn from you, Bill. Uh, we have uh, a few more future oriented questions that I want to make sure that uh, uh, that we can get to because these are pointing in some really interesting directions a little further ahead. Uh, one comes from uh, Liberty University. Alicia Charlesworth asks, with the recent changes in federal administration, what changes do you anticipate from the Department of Education? Well, they haven't been there 100 days yet, and the uh, position that uh, works most closely with higher education has not had a, an undersecretary confirmed yet. James Caval is President Biden's uh, suggestion uh, for the undersecretary or deputy secretary, whatever the appropriate title is, for higher education. And so we're kind of waiting. As a matter of fact, I think uh, today's the 14th. Tomorrow it then is his, con or today's 15th. Today was supposed to be his confirmation. So we'll see. Uh, we don't know what direction they're going yet. Right now, they're still dealing with COVID and the uh, and the budget that um, the uh, president submitted, you know, for bridges and uh, all of that stuff. So they haven't gotten to higher ed yet. So I don't, if there's something you want me to take forward, let me know. Well, there's a lot in that uh, in that infrastructure bill. Yeah. Pell Grant is what the federal government tends to focus on more than anything, which is the role of the federal government. Uh, I just assume them stay out of the rest of our business, but they don't <laughs> always find a way to do that. Uh, so I, I don't know what their, uh, you know, their emphasis will be. Well, that's a good question. Uh, thank you for asking that, Alicia. Uh, and a, a kind of related question, actually a very related question, it comes from uh, Ophelia Mangan at uh, Columbia University. And she asks, do you think accreditors have a role to play in how higher ed addresses issues of climate variability and change? Climate as in weather climate, I presume she's talking uh, about? I'm assuming climate change as a whole in the climate crisis. I, I'm, as opposed to racial climate or social justice climate, you're talking about weather climate, yeah. 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 Um, do I think that higher education has a role to play in that? Of course, do, uh, the accreditors have a role to play. Yeah. Eh, not directly. I'd, I'd be interested to talk with you, Ophelia, though, and see what you had in mind with that one, because that's not something that I would think, unless we're talking about an academic program that somehow provides you know, data to the conversation uh, and the research agenda that's going on at an institution. I don't know what role we would play, but you know, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. I have to confess, I'm, I'm just the moderator today, but I'm, I'm also working on my next book, which is about higher education and climate change. So uh, I, I, I could hazard a guess that she may also be thinking about how a campus uh, approaches protecting its physical campus. Uh, well, we, we have standards that talk about the safety of a campus, you know, and... and um, that might be it. That may be it. But other than that, I don't know that we would, you know, go in any other direction. Well, uh, actually, if you wanted to say more, so let me just let me just bring her up on stage so she can join us. Sure. So this is a uh, hello, Ophelia. Hi, hi. Thank you. I know this might seem like a you know out of left field kind of question, but um, so you know, uh, Brian well knows is he's researching his book and doing this work, and and I work at Columbia's Climate School, which is a brand new school. We're very much in the process of becoming, and and accrediting is is going to be a big part of that, indeed. And it's something that, you know, 
for me personally and professionally, I feel like it's, it's an issue that we all need to examine in every aspect of, of our everyday lives and, and certainly the, the work that we do and the decision making that's related to that. And so I was just curious if that's something that, you know, you or your, your accrediting agency in particular and then the broader role in terms of, you know, the, the role that you do play in helping to inform and, and sometimes set standards, right? You spoke earlier about what you think the role of, of an institution or an agency like yours plays in, in terms of requiring, um, you know, things, but, but that you, you're a really thought leaders here in, in setting the tone for, for conversations. And it's something that um, is an aspect of the curriculum to be sure and addressing these issues and integrating it. Different schools have, have had different approaches to this and I'm excited for Brian's book and to, to learn more about what others are doing there. Um, but then, you know, also just the ethos of climate justice itself sure. and how it certainly dovetails with so many other social justice issues as you, as you mentioned before. But then, you know, the infrastructure component of, of institutions and you know, online educate. I mean, it really just, you could go kind of the whole way. And so I would, if it's not something that you have thought about before, I would maybe encourage and invite you to to raise it and and think about how you, um, you might change be able to. Just, just wrote a post-it to myself uh, because it's not something as a topic, you know, in and of itself that we've talked about. We do have a standard that requires institutions to provide a safe environment for their for their, uh, you know, not just their students, but anybody who comes to campus, just a safe environment. And if we did anything, we would expand that standard to include climate change. But I, I have taken it. I have a meeting in June with my board, so I'll move it forward. Thank you for that. Well, I hope that you share, you know, some thoughts about that with Brian yeah. and maybe you can pass it along to us. And and um, I'd also be just very happy and curious to, to see what comes to that conversation. Okay. Thank you Great. so much. Sure, thank you. I'll follow up with both of you, definitely. Thank okay. you. Um, and if you're if you're new to the forum or if you haven't used the Shindig technology, that's an example of a video question. It, it's really that easy. Um, I feel we pressed a button, I pressed a button, and it just works like that. Um, like I said, this is the part of the program where we look at more future-oriented questions, and that's a great example of one. Um, although it's it's less and less the future. Um, Bill, I don't know if you saw the study out in uh, Cape Cod. The uh, U.S. Weather Service just abandoned a weather station um, because it was right on the bluff on the Atlantic, and the bluff is being subsided by uh, rising sea levels. So they just said they're going to uh, destroy the station and move on. They're not going to relocate it. They might have to just build another one somewhere else. Yeah. No, I had not seen that. That's already happening. Uh, so we have uh, more questions. Uh, we had. A, I'm sorry. This is a follow-up question that I, I missed. My apologies, uh, Lena. Um, and she asked um, about what's the best place to read up on changes in accrediting agencies? That's a great question. What? Um, changes in accrediting agencies in general. Oh, well, I don't know in general we, because we're each still so very independently managed. Each of us has a website. And I know on ours, we have something called recent updates or recent changes. So you can find out what's going on with us there. Um, I send an email to every one of our presidents after each of our board meetings, uh, after both of our board meetings, with updates of things that have happened. And I would hope that they we do encourage them to circulate that. And some of them do, some of them don't. Um, you know, but that's that's kind of the way it, we, when we make changes to our standards, you know, those are first and foremost and on the front page of the web page uh, so that people can give us input and stuff like that. But otherwise, I don't know that there's one single place to which you can go that will find stuff. There is a, uh, a, a better place, though. I just thought about it. CRAC does have a website. We just uh, started it last year, which is probably why I didn't think about it. That is C-RAC. And we put a dash there because otherwise it would be crack and people would not pay any attention to us. So it is crack.org. And um, Alex has uh, tried to gather things that are going on that are both uh, specific to uh, all of us, but then things that are individual to our regions as well on that site. So that's, that's a place that we try to keep updated so that uh, people can find out what's going on. But more often than not, You'll have to go to the individual accreditors page. Yeah, that's a great on our web page, also there is a set of links to everybody else's of the other regionals' web pages. You don't have to go search for yourself. You can just <clears throat> click on that link. That's very handy. Uh, thank you, thank you, Bill. It's a great practical question, Lena. And 
always glad to hear a graduate student thinking about this kind of thing. Um, we have uh, uh, more questions that are having to do with specific policies and specific issues. Uh, so I want to make sure that we get a chance to uh, touch on these. Um, for example, we have uh, one from uh, another from Sally Mudiamu, who asks about university rankings. What do you think about them, especially global rankings that universities focus on and their intersection with accreditation? Yeah, I don't think rankings have a thing to do with accreditation. Um, it, and so I, that, that's one of those conversations I stay out of. I, that, that doesn't have anything to do with my job, and so I ignore them. I'd look at rankings during football and basketball and baseball season to see that the Southern region is now the reigning champ in both basketball and football. Uh, <laughs> so we're waiting to see what happens in baseball. Um, you know, um, there, there are different rankings for different things. We do ask our institutions to identify at least five of their peers uh, to whom they think that they are in, um, in enough similarity in who they are and what they do that they can keep up with each other. Uh, and we can compare them if we need to in certain areas, or we can certainly refer them to those other institutions saying, you know, institution A has 92% uh, graduation rate, you only have 14%. If you really think that that's your peer, you know, you need to talk to them to find out what they're doing and how successful they're being. Uh, otherwise, I don't deal with rankings. Very good. All of all 780 of my institutions are number one. That's, that's, you are a membership organization. <laughs> and they pay my salary, so I think they're all wonderful. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's a very, very good question, uh, and, and that's a really solid answer. Thank you. Um, uh, we had a follow-up from uh, Mark Corbett Wilson about his question about California and the state government, and he said he thinks it was the Private Post-Secondary Education Act. Of oh, I got what you, yeah, I, and so the question was, do I think that they'll bring it back? Was that the original question? I, yeah, I okay. do know what you, it'll have. Yeah, you know, I think it was, a, it did them a great disservice to get rid of it, uh, and I'm on uh, NC Sarah's board, which is the organization that uh, kind of coordinates distance learning across the country. And California is the one state that does not belong because they don't have an agency, you know, one agency to which institutions can go and say, hey, I'd like to get licensed in your state. Uh, it's created a political problem and a directional problem from folks. I'm hearing though that they're trying to rectify that, that there is another agency they've identified at least as a temporary uh, hold for doing that kind of thing. But uh, it, you know, if, if you look at the nation as a whole and how we do try to communicate across the country, that has uh, created a, a, you know, a roadblock. And it, it, it leaves those institutions that are in need of information, you know, without a source to go to. So yes, hopefully they'll bring it back. Interesting. Thank you, Mark, for following up, and uh, thank you. I'm I'm astonished at just the breadth of your knowledge in this field right now, which is it, it's extraordinary. Thank uh, you. We had uh, uh, another. Uh, I, I think of this as a as a technical question, but it's really just a specific question. Again, from Calvin Bentley, who asks, "How will accreditation change in terms of its practices as more schools adopt the use of competency-based education? Is there a need for a new type of accreditation body focused on CBE?" Yeah, we, we don't think so. We've been doing uh, CBE forever. Uh, it is not a new concept. This is my 48th year in higher education. I was two when I started. And uh, CBE has been around for a very long time. We haven't been able to get a lot of institutions to uh, buy into the concept because there's a lot of work involved. Uh, and I think that in some cases, faculty feel like if I don't have to stand up and teach in front of a class, then you're not gonna need me. So why would I be in supportive of competency-based education? For those who may not be familiar, or at least to ensure we're all on this, talking the same language, we're talking about not having to go to a class, but just being able to demonstrate competencies. So faculty have to identify what are those competencies that if you were gonna take uh, uh, engineering 101, you know, that you would need to be able to demonstrate mastery in order for me to give you a passing grade. Uh, and so not only do they have to identify the competencies, but they have to assess those competencies. So I think that there is definitely a role for faculty. It's just not standing up in front of a classroom, you know, being the expert. Uh, like I said, we've been doing that. We have some institutions that currently do that. We have not found it any more difficult than evaluating any other type of instructional modality. And so I, I don't know that there'll be a, a separate accreditor, but there may be. Um, 
ACE has been doing that for courses for a while. Mm -hmm. Kale has been doing that for um, lifelong learning experiences. So we have entities out there that have been involved in it since at least the 1970s. Mm. Uh, so I, I don't know. And no accrediting body has come up you know, to do that. Uh, you know, one of the challenges with being an accreditor is that uh, you need to be recognized by the Department of Ed. And that whole process is enough to deter people from, you know, wanting to, to do anything because it's a lot of paperwork as government stuff is. Thanks to you. Uh, Kelvin, thank you for that question. That's a really important point to mention. We, we have time for two last questions. And, and so I'm going to start off with a specific one from Deb Adair at Quality Matters. Uh, and Deb asks, CRAC just posted 21st century distance education guidelines developed through collaborative work led by NC Sarah and NCAMS. How will SAC COC use them? And I've never seen so many acronyms. <laughs> Well, uh, NCHIMS is a National Higher Education Management System out in Colorado, and because NC Sarah is located there, they often work together on things. They are a, a data organization. Um, those guidelines were developed because the CRAC guidelines had not been uh, revised since distance education first became a big deal back in the early 2000s. Uh, and we said that, you know, we have now taken, when our guidelines first came out, there was no direction on how to evaluate distance learning because it was a hit or miss kind of thing. The more institutions began to do distance learning, then the more it required us to say how we were going to look at it. And we came up with one set of standards that, to which we agreed we would all uh, evaluate institutions. Well, now we have incorporated those guidelines into our actual processes. So the guidelines are a moot point because they're already in our, in our standards and the way we do things. However, NC Sarah, because they're dealing with everybody in the country and not a particular region, wanted some guidelines so that everybody across the country could be singing from the same song sheet. So that's why they developed those. And we passed by them. I was on the review committee that looked at them. We had no problems with them because there's nothing in there that we're not already doing. Uh, and so they're fine. <laughs> well, thank you. That's a great Incredible question, in all seriousness. That was, uh, I'm really glad to hear it. This is becoming a bit of a graduate seminar uh, <laughs> on accreditation. This is fantastic. Here's the last question, and this is the big one. Uh, this comes from my friend and colleague, Jay Gary. We both work at the Association of Professional Futurists. And uh, he asks, what changes do you see on the horizon out to 2024 and beyond? Uh, in part, given the new administration and Senate. Yeah. Uh, Jay, my crystal ball is a little foggy. Uh, and part of that is because I never know. Well, it's about like, but milky like that. Yeah. I never know from day to day what idea is going to come up from anybody on the Hill. Uh, as the leaderships change, you know, the, the emphasis changes. Uh, right now, higher education is not high on their list of things about which to be concerned. If it were, then the Higher Ed Act would have been reauthorized already. And it has not been reauthorized since 2008, but it's supposed to be reauthorized every five years. And so we're already so far behind that there are so many other predictions. So I don't know that there are a lot of new things in, you know, from now until 2030 that will be impacted other than free college tuition, uh, Pell Grant, um, you know, funding uh, minority serving institutions who uh, have historically been underfunded. Those are the kinds of things that we're hearing about right now. Uh, I, I don't know where it's going. Again, James Caval has not gotten in place yet. Nobody's been able to give him or the secretary a laundry list of the things they want to see happen. And, you know, they work just like your institutions do. Somebody comes up with a bright idea. They take it to the leadership. The leadership says, OK, let's let's run with that. And so I, I don't know. I hate to end this session with I don't know, but that's one thing on which I don't know. <laughs> but that is, some, that is something that you answer in all honesty and candor, which is a fantastic way to end. Um, <laughs> my gosh, o Ophelia, this is such a, a rich session. You have been so generous with your time and your thought. Thank you so much. Uh, what, what's the best way to keep up with you? Is it with the uh, SAC COC site? Uh, yeah, my yeah, my email address is on there, but it's bwhelan at saxioc.org. Uh, just drop me an email. That's the easiest way. And uh, I do answer them. It may take me a, a day or two, but it doesn't usually take me longer than 48 hours to get back to you. 
And any ideas that you have, uh, this year I happen to be chair of CREC, so I have conversations with all of the accreditors, so all of the formerly known as regionally accreditors. So uh, if there's something that you want us all to address, by all means, uh, send me a note and I'll share the information. Well, I think uh, Ophelia and I will uh, follow up about climate change, among other Please things. Please do. And but I do have my poster here. Well, <laughs> in, in the meantime, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. You take care, and we'll be following up. All righty. But don't everybody leave, because we have a lot with uh, pointers for the next uh, week, as well as for the next few sessions. And uh, while we bring those up, thank you all for a fantastic, fantastic range of questions. Just looking ahead, over the next couple of months, uh, we have topics including progressive education in higher ed, the intersection of technology and academia, improving education and equity for black students, how to spark emerging ed tech conversations. We've got the people who run the M Tech MOOC, as well as questions about policy changes, and quite a few more. If you'd like to learn more, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us, and you can learn more. If you'd like to keep talking about these issues of accreditation, everything from competency-based education to the impact of federal policy, regional versus national accreditation, we have multiple venues, uh, including Slack, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Twitter tends to be the most active. If you'd like to go back to our archive, the forum is now in its sixth year, so we have more than 250 recordings, including one session with another regional accreditor, or then regional accreditor, uh, please dive in. Just go to tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive and you can dig in. Uh, in the meantime, thank you again for a fantastic conversation. Uh, please, above all, take care of yourselves, be well, stay safe, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye. <laughs>